Uh, all right. And so as I record, we will uh, share screen and up should come uh, my, everybody see my slide? Yes. Okay, that's a, a good thing. So, all right. So um, we are uh, ending uh, the High Middle Ages. And the High Middle Ages saw um, a peak of intellectual activity. We talked a lot about uh, Peter Abelard. He's not the only one, but he, he was the representative um, for the, the whole group of thinkers. And um, Roger Bacon, uh, more uh, on the religious side, the Franciscan, uh, First time Oxford appears in, in our lectures, he, he, and he started doing uh, some scientific uh, inquiry. Um, and of course, uh, uh, we had uh, Carol's lecture um, on uh, Da Vinci, uh, uh, and he is uh, going to be uh, waiting at the other side of the bridge uh, when we get to the uh, Renaissance. But uh, with that uh, newfound intellectual uh, 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 confidence, uh, there was also a military confidence. And so uh, a Christian Europe um, spread by war to the north uh, in, into the Baltic. Uh, the Teutonic Knights, uh, they just come back from the crusade, which we talked about in a previous lecture. Um, the, uh, to the south is the uh, Reconquista. Uh, now it's going to take a, a couple of hundred years um, to kick the Muslims uh, out and reestablish a, a Christian uh, Spain, but it's starting. Uh, and to the west, uh, uh, the uh, Leif Erikson. Uh, 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 possibly discovers the uh, uh, new world. How about to the East? We haven't talked much about the East since we talked about uh, Constantinople and Orthodox uh, Christianity. So let's just go back and review a little bit about what's going on in the East. And this is uh, preparatory to next week's talk, which is going to be on uh, the rise of, of Russia. Um, ah, here's Juan Jose. Welcome, Juan. Hello, uh, everyone. I'm uh, sorry for the delay. Thank you for letting me in. Hello, Juan. Yeah, you, uh, thank uh, you. Thank us for no letting problem. you in. You, you started this whole thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm really you, sorry. You, you have <laughs> you have special privileges just by asking <laughs> your innocent question. This Juan, do you remember my sister Shigeko? You met her when you were about sixteen. <laughs> I do. I remember she gave me a, 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 a like a notebook to draw. I still have it. How are you doing, Mrs. Shigeko? Fine, thank you. Hi. <laughs> It's so okay. good to see you. You're looking well. It's good seeing you. Uh, okay. Well, we'll at the at the very end uh, when I turn off the slides, we'll we'll get together in a big gallery view and and catch up. But uh, Shigeko Juan Jose asked the question. Uh, tell me, Mr. John, what is civilization? And uh, uh, off we went. We've been we've been on this uh, journey for eleven months. Uh, so uh, just a, a quick review, uh, Juan, we're talking about the expansion of uh, Europe, uh, uh, and, and we haven't talked much about the expansion of Europe to the east, and uh, the Slavs are, arrived there around 500, 600, um, and, and started uh, expanding, and that was in the backyard of uh, uh, Eastern Christianity in Constantinople. And we'll see uh, how that, that interacts. Um, the uh, Slavs uh, centered here in these marshes on a particular river. They probably came from the, from the steppes originally, 
but then by the uh, by 600 uh, they were here and we're going to see them expand uh, to the north into what will become uh, Russia um, and here's Moscow way up here and uh, uh, just to uh, uh, keep uh, this in the back of your mind, why did they uh, spread north? Why not south? Uh, well, one thing are the Khazars. They're, they're a pretty uh, a militant uh, people. So it's, it wasn't easy. But well, there's another group we'll talk about. Um, so in 500 to 600, I want to talk about that because that's not on the map. Ignore the red line for now. Uh, this is a map showing the expansion of Christianity. And the pink part starts at 600. Well, wait a minute. Uh, what, what happened to the 500s? Rome falls in like 485. Um, and uh, the barbarians uh, uh, take over. Uh, where was uh, Christianity then? And, and we'll come back and we'll talk more about the, the later expansion, but I want to focus on what's not on the map, 500 to 600. And 500, um, St. Patrick's legacy, um, Christianity lives on in Ireland. Um, it's exempt from the uh, Germanic tribes that come uh, roaring in. And uh, 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 Ireland, particularly Northern Ireland and these little islands uh, off to the west of, of Scotland um, maintain Christianity. Um, I think the, uh, this was their base, Iona, St. Columba. Um, uh, he was, of all these Irish monasteries, he was the one that was most interested in missionary work. And he sent missionaries uh, to Lindisfarne uh, later on, uh, and, but also to the continent. And this came uh, crashing through to me when we were traveling with our friends. Uh, and we went to this uh, monastery, St. Gall. Um, and I, ah, that's interesting. And you read this, and it was the Hermitage of an Irish missionary, Gallus, who had established himself in the year uh, 612. So by then, uh, the uh, uh, Irish missionaries had already uh, established monasteries in all, all these uh, cities, uh, leading one author to, to uh, maybe exaggerate it a little bit, but that's where Christianity stayed alive and was sent back to Europe by, by missionaries where it had fallen on tough times. And so this is uh, uh, Iona uh, where St. Columbo was from the years uh, uh, 530 to 590 roughly. Um, and uh, he was one of the great successors of uh, uh, St. Uh, uh, Patrick. Um, and uh, we have visited there. Uh, I visited there twice. Uh, Linda, I took uh, our mom uh, there. And then um, for our 50th wedding anniversary, and Iko and I uh, uh, went there. And so what- Oh, uh, you said you went there for your 50th? Did you, uh, uh, I know you went to Russia for your 50th as well, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, th th that was uh, a year later. So um, this well, and let me just a, say, this... Juan Jose wasn't here last week, so I just want to introduce myself to him. Juan Jose, I'm John's sister. Yeah, yeah well, well, we'll meet at the very end. We'll turn on, uh, uh, turn off the share slide, and okay. and uh, we'll, we'll we'll have a chance to talk then. So. Um, this was uh, uh, Saint Columba's uh, kingdom of uh, Dal Riada, um, uh, and note these are the Hebrides, and I, I mentioned that for my sister. This is uh, where the McNeils uh, are from. They're actually from the Inner Hebrides and the Outer Hebrides, uh, but that's uh, my mother's our mother's maiden name. Uh, Saint Columba uh, he converted uh, the Picts. 
uh, uh, by legend, he also tamed uh, the Loch Ness monster. <laughs> uh, some things are uh, uh, just too good to leave out. Uh, so, sorry. Um, so um, let's finish the expansion to the east. What is this red line? Okay, we'll come back to that. But um, it's the uh, uh, the division between uh, Rome Christianity and Constantinople uh, Christianity. Um, and this becomes Orthodox, um, uh, and they are at this point controlling uh, Turkey. Um, and uh, the Western uh, Christianity, of course, is, is, is centered in, in Rome. So uh, by 600, uh, all this pink area has been settled by Christianity, both East uh, and West. Um, uh, there's no, the red line's kind of just a, a, a small line at that point. Um, in uh, 800, you get uh, uh, the uh, influence of uh, the Irish missionaries uh, reconverting um, uh, Lower Britain, which had been taken over by Anglo-Saxons and um, uh, Germany uh, itself. Then uh, by 1100, uh, really spread uh, east. And this is when we're gonna be talking about the, uh, the Slavs and, and, and the Russians uh, later on. Um, and then in the uh, 1300s, finally you get the Teutonic Knights uh, conquering the Balts. The, the Balts, uh, as in Baltic, uh, the Balts were still pagans, and they were the, the last uh, to to uh, uh, convert. Note Lithuania holds out the the longest, <laughs> and they. Uh, uh, take, take even longer uh, to convert, but once they convert, they're, they're pretty good uh, Christians. So the red line becomes really dark red with the great schism in the 11th century. And you may remember this uh, from when we were talking about the early years of uh, Orthodox uh, Christianity. So before the great schism, there are a lot of little uh, uh, break off uh, heresies, if you will, um, that, that account for all this uh, plethora of uh, uh, Christian churches. Um, and uh, so uh, Juan's coming back in on his phone. He must have had some problems. Uh, so, so this is uh, the, the great split between the reds and, and the blues. They're the major ones. Um, so, uh, so with expansion in all four directions, what could possibly go wrong? Well, here comes the uh, Mongols, external armies sweeping down from the steps, um, coming all the way uh, to uh, uh, the door of, of Hungary, uh, capturing um, the Slavic uh, territories, um, uh, and the Turks will soon follow from the steppes, as, as, as we'll see. But this is a recurring theme um, that Juan Jose remembers from the very beginning. Constantly, militant tribes pouring out of the steppes. They, we first encountered it when the Aryans came down in uh, uh, 1500 uh, BCE to uh, conquer the Indus River, the, uh, one of the four river civilizations. Uh, and it's been going on periodically ever since. We, uh, I'm sure we've, we've talked about 10 waves of steppe warriors. So the Mongols are probably the most uh, consequential uh, of all the steppe warriors and what they, they seize control of the Silk Road uh, completely. Uh, they uh, uh, threaten Islam big time, taking uh, Baghdad um, 
uh, and uh, they, they were very brutal. Uh, but after they settled and uh, the S Silk Road reopened with more security than ever, <laughs> no bandits wanted to interfere with uh, uh, Pax Mongolia, the, the peace of the Mongols. Um, but it wasn't very peaceful in, in the first 50 years, that's for sure. And here's just another map of it showing the curvature of the earth, which uh, I, I always, uh, always gives me um, uh, perspective. Um, and what's the second external threat? Global ch uh, weather change. This time, uh, the medieval period, the high middle ages had enjoyed a global warming. Um, and we look back at this map and we see, wait a minute, there was global warming in, in the Roman periods, the dark ages had cooled off. And then we went into a little ice age, which arguably we're coming out of. So this map kind of opened my mind a little bit. All these uh, uh, climate change deniers talk about natural cycles and, and I kind of blew them off. So the modern temperature is way even higher than the previous warming. And there, there's no doubt that we're dealing now with man-made global warming, but it may be on top of a natural uh, warming cycle, poorly understood. Um, so what happened? Uh, the Great Famine. Uh, the, the, the population had, had grew, uh, uh, had grown during the, the warm period. They got used to plentiful crops. And when Little Ice Age came, all of a sudden, uh, there's a great famine. Um, and uh, uh, villages are abandoned. Uh, the population drops and people start looking for scapegoats and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get to one. But before you can uh, recover from uh, the Mongols and uh, uh, the Little Ice Age, a third thing comes uh, arriving through trade routes. This, this are two terminuses from uh, the Silk Road. Um, it, it branches off over here and one uh, uh, terminus to the uh, uh, northern uh, Silk Road uh, ends in the Crimea. Uh, that, that's been in the news the last couple of decades. Uh, Putin uh, seized it. What's the Crimea? Well, it turns out in, in world history, uh, uh, it's a pretty damn important place. But in, in, in any case, um, this, the uh, uh, traders from Genoa, they had the Crimea franch franchise and they went up um, through the Bosphorus um, and uh, went to the Crimea, traded goods and, and came back. And they were the ones that uh, first bought uh, the, the Black Plague uh, to um, uh, Sicily, and then home to uh, Genoa, and it started spreading. So you can follow uh, the, the colors, uh, the years, first uh, the, uh, uh, the orange, uh, then uh, green, then, then yellow, then purple, then um, uh, finally uh, uh, pink. Um, and another way of, of looking at it, um, the, uh, uh, by this map, the Northeast was relatively spared. Somehow it didn't really go North. This wasn't uh, fully populated, but this is the area of, of, of the Slavs. Um, and uh, they were spared. Uh, and when the Jews get blamed for the Black Death uh, in the Northeast, there's not as much of an experience of the Black Death. So they received Jewish immigrants, um, uh, particularly in, in the, the Slavic areas um, of Poland and Western uh, uh, Russia. 
And we, uh, that's an important bit when we get to the uh, 20th century, obviously. Um, so um, this is the, the mechanics of it, the biology uh, of it. It's uh, um, a, a flea. It's a flea from uh, a particular kind of flea, ratus ratus flea belongs on the uh, uh, rat came first from the, the wild rat, then got into the more domestic rats, uh, and uh, finally uh, to humans. Uh, first is just lymph nodes, the bubonic plague. And we saw, uh, when we were on the Navajo reservation, we saw uh, bubonic uh, plague periodically, which is easily controlled with tetracycline, a very common. Uh, antibiotic, but if you don't know what it is and you can't treat it, it spreads to the lungs and then it spreads uh, lung to lung. Uh, and that's the, that was uh, uh, the, the disaster. Finally, they figured out the, uh, how to keep rats off of ships by, by putting those semicircular iron uh, uh, contraptions uh, onto the ropes. So rats couldn't shinny up and down the ropes. A very simple uh, uh, aid. Uh, so a lot of dead, uh, um, uh, the numbers vary. Nobody uh, knows uh, for sure. A wretched kind of thing. This just summarizes it again here. Here was the initial um, uh, Crimean uh, port, uh, the Genoan ships went up there, bought it back, and uh, there it spread. And again, relatively sparing uh, in, the, in the Northeast. Um, uh, who knows, but uh, the population certainly dropped off, not just in Europe, but also in China. So this was a probably a pandemic, pandemic. Um, and they're burying people uh, 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 every day. Um, unfortunately, you look at um, uh, uh, scenes from uh, Brazil in the early part of, of the COVID pandemic, you see uh, 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 pictures like this. Uh, and the, the church takes a, a brunt. I just focus on the red here. Uh, the, the church were noble. They helped uh, uh, care for the sick uh, and dying. Uh, so the most generous clergy died. Um, and then you had the, uh, uh, the, the two extremes after that. Uh, th there were some uh, reactions that said, what the hell, uh, let's enjoy ourselves life shorter than we think. And then there are others who said, we, we, we are being punished by God, let's punish ourselves. Um, and uh, extreme uh, uh, reactions. So by this time, there are really only two mature nations, England and France. Um, and so how did they deal with all these crises? They had a hundred years war. Uh, so let's, uh, let's start uh, and review how these two become nations. So we'll start uh, with the withdrawal of Rome as uh, Rome falls. And you will remember ultimately the, the uh, German kingdoms of, uh, uh, that become, uh, this becomes Charlemagne the Grey, uh, 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 the uh, three grandsons of Charlemagne, Lothar, uh, uh, controls this, this middle uh, territory. And uh, the blue uh, Louis uh, becomes um, really the Holy Roman uh, uh, Empire, ultimately uh, uh, the core of, of uh, Germany. Um, so uh, uh, that, that's France, uh, Charlemagne. Uh, to uh, England, um, their Celtic population at the time of King Arthur, and King Arthur myths deal with this, the invasion of Anglo-Saxons. Anglo-Saxons, this is their first uh, appearance. Um, and they ultimately develop a real culture um, with uh, King Alfred becoming a uh, uh, enlightened king and who, who gives uh, uh, takes Roman law and changes it uh, a bit into, uh, into common law. 
Um, and so at this uh, period of time, Italy uh, has successful city states, but their very success as city states prevents them from, from organizing. Ironically, not quite as successful are England and France, um, but uh, uh, they're successful enough to uh, support towns and uh, densely populated uh, areas. So they're the two candidates to go ahead and form um, a nation, which is actually uh, a very strong warlord saying to the other warlords, uh, from now on, it's, it, it, it's me, guys, and I'm taking all these uh, scholars that are coming out of universities like, uh, like Paris, like Oxford, and uh, we're going to start a bureaucracy, and we're going to keep track of uh, taxes, and we're actually going to have a budget. I'm going to use all these scholars well. And everything's going along just fine. Uh, here's Paris. Nice, sleepy little Paris. Um, uh, the inherit now we're talking a, a few hundred years after Charlemagne, but they've built up, they got a university and uh, who covets it? The Vikings. In come the Vikings, right down the river saying, it's all over boys. Um, and uh, Charles the Simple uh, uh, meets his Viking conqueror and he says, wait a second. I got a deal for you. I'll give you Normandy if you just leave Paris. You can have all of Normandy. Rouen's nice, not far from Chart. Uh, and uh, all of a sudden, the Vikings have a uh, homeland down in uh, the lower lower Europe. Weather's much nicer than it is in Norway. Um, Meanwhile, uh, the Danes uh, come down and um, uh, conquer the Anglo-Saxons. So it's G a, a German on German. Um, and you, you get the, uh, the Dane law uh, that um, uh, builds on Alfred the Great and what he's done. Finally, you get the Norman invasion. Okay, so this is the big one. Here, here's Normandy, they built up. And they look across the channel and they say that, that, that you know, the Anglo-Saxons, uh, we're, we're stronger than them. Let, let's go and take over England. And they do famously in 1066. But look down here, the, 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 the Vikings are also uh, busy and, and some of them are, are Normans that actually come from their, their new headquarters and they take over Southern Italy, Sicily, uh, North Africa, and then finally, famously, the Crusades, um, uh, 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 Norman control. Uh, so what you've got now are cousins on both sides of the channel. Um, so you, you have the, the Normans who's, uh, in France whose political influence has grown, so they're always a player in uh, appointing the king of France, but they're in charge, the Normans are, in um, England. And Henry uh, the, uh, the, uh, II works out a deal with his uh, distant cousin uh, uh, over uh, Aquitaine. Um, we're not going to get in the details of, of this, um, but uh, uh, Aquitaine uh, was the, the uh, area that both uh, uh, cousins, both the king of France and the king of England, uh, coveted. Um, and uh, what's going on in England about that time? Well, King John, uh, he gets himself into a, into a bunch of trouble. Of course, we learn about King John and the Robin Hood uh, myths, and we learn at the end of Robin Hood that his brother Richard, uh, the Lionhearted, comes back from a crusade, and King John is in trouble, but then Richard dies, and King John finally has to make some uh, concessions. It's what's called the law of Magna Carta, but all that is is a, uh, a little bit of backpedaling by the monarch, 
okay, nobles, um, oh, and, and the nobles are just local warlords. I've overplayed my hand. Uh, I'm going to give. I'm going to give you some. Allow you to exhibit your consent, and uh, we're 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 going to write some uh, down some rules on how uh, I can uh, rule over you. Um, so the, this is what we're not going to get into. Uh, it's always somebody dies without an heir, and then uh, all hell breaks loose. And the um, uh, uh, there is an invasion, and uh, 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 sort of perversely, uh, there are nobles in France who are jealous of uh, this uh, Valois. Anybody speak French? Um, and he, uh, they don't much like this uh, uh, king who's grasping so much centralized uh, power. So they don't ne necessarily oppose the uh, English cousins, Norman cousins that, that invade. So it's very complicated. Um, but at, at one point, uh, they, they come uh, uh, up with some uh, short-lived solution. I, I pledge you, but he, 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 he turns around and claims Aquitaine uh, anyway, Edward II of England. Uh, and I'm sorry, we're, we just can't spend time on this. There's uh, too much to cover, uh, but the war breaks out. And uh, here's Aquitaine down here. Here were the cousins originally. So uh, England, there was this cross claim to uh, Bordeaux um, and uh, the uh, uh, Normans uh, uh, of France had said, okay, uh, we understand. But then uh, the English got greedy and said, we, we want Aquitaine, and they took Aquitaine. And so you'll see um, uh, these stars, famous battles that when we re read English history, we read about Poitiers, we read about Crecy. Uh, we read about Calais um, and the uh, uh, English Normans uh, get very uh, uh, successful. Uh, finally, they say, you know, it's nice down here in southern France, but, you know, it might be nice to have northern France, too. So they kind of backtrack and leave Aquitaine, the original uh, uh, problem, and focus on uh, northern uh, France. And now you've got Agincourt, Henry V, Shakespeare's Henry V, famously, uh, the Battle of Agincourt uh, uh, takes place. And then all of a sudden, the, the French find a um, backbone and they, they follow a, a mystic uh, leader. And you're all thinking about who it could be, right? Right. And here she is. Uh -huh. Joan of Arc. She is their mystic leader. She rallies France. And when you uh, have the argument about um, what makes history, uh, uh, is it conditions or is it personalities, Certainly, you've got to reckon with, with Joan of Arc um, in, that, in that argument. And she rallies her troops. Let's get the, the British out of uh, northern France, and uh, off they go. She, of course, is captured and, and burned at the stake, but she lives uh, eternally um, in, in statues all around uh, uh, France, and uh, France regains um, and it's, you know, there are conditions, there are things going on in England, and uh, 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 you can read a lot of histories uh, accounting for many other factors, but um, what I, I, I'm trying to do for this course is give you the broad uh, uh, brush strokes of, of what went on, and you can come back and read more on your own. Finally, uh, the successor uh, King uh, wipes out all the, the uh, uh, disloyal nobles who secretly had been uh, rooting for 
um, uh, uh, the English, and now you've got a solid monarchy uh, in in France uh, to match uh, to match the solid monarchy uh, that that uh, uh, the Normans continue uh, in in England. But before that, there there still is a lot of uh, local warlords who uh, escape from central power and. Um, that's what a noble is, is a local warlord. And what they, they do is uh, they're corrupt and they extort a mafia style. It's really a protection racket. From the very be beginning of, of the history, when we talked about it, uh, uh, what makes civilization, we always said uh, that the first uh, step is uh, the police function. The, the violence that uh, the strong uh, use to police uh, the weak. And then they, it's, it's not much different than the protection rackets you see um, in uh, uh, poorly governed uh, uh, small cities um, all, all around uh, the world. Um, and this is uh, the Robin Hood uh, 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 myth. The, the Sheriff of Nottingham was basically in a, a protection uh, racket. And we see Robin Hood, uh, our legendary outlaw, Juan Jose, in the tree um, ambushing the, the local warlords uh, the sheriff, from the Sheriff of Nottingham. Um, and uh, uh, the, these stories uh, continue. I tell them to my uh, grandkids, whether they're true or not, uh, doesn't matter as we've said so much about civilization. Uh, civilization is what people believe and the myths and the stories um, are as important at creating a cohesive civilization as, as anything else. Um, and so I've, I've tried to uh, sketch this out um, uh, for us, what uh, uh, the whole uh, scope of the Middle Ages, we, we, uh, we realized when the Romans fell, the one surviving thing was the Christian church, ironically, and uh, bishops uh, took the place of the local Ro uh, Roman uh, administrators, a, 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 a diocese is not a, a, a Christian term, it's a Roman term. And those uh, uh, dioceses were preserved, it's just the bishop took over from the Romans. Uh, and then uh, you had the, the, the invading German uh, tribes uh, come in and they gradually became warlords and nobles and they worked with the the, the church to establish some kind of early order. Uh, uh, the, but this was the dark ages, all this thing settling out. The big role of monasteries at, at this point, um, uh, uh, particularly Benedictines. Um, and very slowly um, uh, with the uh, uh, establishment of peace, came towns and trade and tr trade rules, commerce. Uh, uh, Juan Jose, you, you're learning that when you're doing international business, there are, there are rules. We have the World Trade Organization. Trade is always, hey, if I'm gonna trust the trade with the next town, we gotta come up with a, a, a set of rules. And it's interesting that, that people that can uh, 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 broker these these trades are often people um, of the same religion. So we see uh, Jews involved in trade between major cities because Jews in one city know Jews in another city and they arrange for the transfer of payments. Uh, you don't want to carry money on trade routes. Uh, th th you just make uh, um, uh, a, a bank note uh, that uh, no warlord concedes and, and do anything with. Um, and we also learn that uh, uh, when we did Islam, that Islam, uh, the spread of Islam boosted trade incredibly. Why? Because it increased credit. Credit is the, 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 uh, the mother's milk of uh, commerce. And if you don't have credit and faith, 
uh, you're not gonna you're not gonna have uh, trade. And these rules great, uh, uh, grew to ethics and ultimately into a bureaucracy and a, and a nation. And this is how, uh, 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 briefly and, and simply, uh, nations were, were uh, uh, born and became part of a, a, a civilization, Juan Jose. So in summary, uh, the plague, uh, it hastened uh, the the um, uh, transforming and the really the downfall of the Catholic uh, uh, Church, the Hundred Years uh, War just piled on on top of that. The the uh, the chaos allowed lo uh, local nobles to become even more uh, corrupt, and all this fed back to the uh, 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 church, which was said, hey, how's come the, the people, the villagers, the farmers, the peasants said, how's come you didn't protect us from the plague? Your, your hocus pocus must not be um, uh, uh, protective. And by the way, uh, the word hocus pocus comes from um, uh, a, a, a sound in the uh, liturgy uh, th that that sounds close to hocus pocus. It's a it's a Latin um, uh, uh, phrase taken out of the liturgy, hocus pocus. So what happens? Well, the Jews did it. Um, uh, uh, the Jews are at fault, and we see uh, uh, the expulsion of uh, Jews um, uh, er, uh, first from from France. Uh, and then uh, from uh, England, we visited York um, uh, two summers ago and uh, uh, experienced the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, expulsion of Jews from a big tower uh, in, in York. It's very, very dramatic. Um, and where do they go? Uh, uh, ultimately, a lot of them go to the uh, Ottoman uh, Empire. Um, uh, some of them, uh, some of them uh, wind up in Venice, interestingly uh, enough. Venice is a, a commercial uh, uh, strength and, and a ghetto is an Italian word and was born from the immigration of uh, uh, the expulsion really of Jews from, from Spain. Uh, and Italy was, was one of the stops, but you'll see, um, as I said earlier, a, a lot of Jews wind up in uh, Poland uh, in, uh, uh, Lithu in, in Lithuania. Uh, Poland, Lithuania, Commonwealth will become uh, the largest uh, country uh, in Europe with time. So the consequences of the Crusades, I, I saved the, this slide just in the red part, as a consequence of the Crusade, uh, the, the Jews along the Rhine uh, who, who did this trade and brokered uh, credit were, were resented and were attacked by the Crusaders on the way to the, uh, the, uh, the Holy Land. Um, uh, and um, as a result uh, of the church losing uh, its uh, credit, uh, you get just this splintering and chaos uh, of the papacy. So uh, there was, and the French uh, king wants to uh, uh, appoint uh, all the local bishops again. We we read about an earlier conflict with that that thing of who's going to appoint the local bishop. And uh, we don't have time to go on this in detail, but just that you know why you get uh, a separate uh, uh, pope in Avignon uh, in southern um, uh, France competing with the uh, uh, other pope in, in Rome. Uh, and the, the people uh, pick, pick sides. So the, the orange are with uh, Avignon and the blue uh, uh, pick, pick Rome. This is before Protestantism. Um, so it, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's confusing. We could spend a whole hour talking about how, who picked the, what Pope, but what you gotta remember is um, that why the papacy uh, uh, got weakened and, and why when we get to the uh, Renaissance, the Reformation and Martin Luther, 
is not far behind. That's all you need to remember. Um, so um, the uh, 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 pretty much just restating uh, what we said, there are winners and there are losers uh, with all these disasters. It's just kind of like globalization today and the uh, uh, international disasters that, that we're seeing. But this caused a tra transition from the Middle Ages to the modern period. And the question is, will we see uh, a transition from the era that we've been in to a new era? God knows we're having plenty of um, uh, traumas and disasters uh, of our own. The church itself, uh, stops being so spiritual and becomes more of uh, uh, a, uh, a secular place. The church is, 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 people are still proud of their church, but it's a place for festivals and celebrations. A little bit less of the spirit that didn't keep the plague away. So uh, what's up with that? They continue to build nice, nice churches, argue that they, they had an edifice complex. Um, and uh, uh, I think I've already done this, um, uh, basically, uh, but the trade, the rules, the ethics, these are the six uh, uh, things, uh, the different colors, not all of them are on here right now, but uh, how does um, a civilization manage power? It's power that's got to be managed. And uh, if we get, want to get away from violence and warlords and corrupt nobles, we've got to come up with other civilized uh, uh, rules, either religious, either uh, uh, money, uh, that there's uh, more money to be made from having uh, peace and less, less violence. And we've got to have the, the, the rules and the development of, of commerce. And so this is, again, is my sketch that I, I, uh, I told you at the beginning, this is where we were gonna go. The green is the church, uh, down it goes a little bit, reaches a high point, and by the end of the uh, Middle Ages, it's at, at a real low point. Meanwhile, everything else is slowly uh, going up, and I wanna draw your attention to the blue. The, the consent that we first saw when we looked at, at Rome and the Rome Senate, uh, the idea of uh, consent, um, a parliament, um, and we'll be talking a lot about uh, parliaments, but parliament was really uh, this taking this idea of consent, uh, absorbing the nobility, the red line, um, and uh, working, the parliament obviously working uh, with the, the, the towns and the guilds and the commerce. Uh, and uh, meantime, what we have are the growth of uh, uh, rules and ethics and, and uh, uh, the national um, uh, bureaucracy. Um, and, uh, not represented is the, the, the scholars and the, the universities that are churning out uh, administrators and bureaucrats. Um, uh, and that's the same, the same chart, just a little bit uh, bigger. Um, peasant revolts, um, uh, not, not surprising, um, centered in, in England and in France. Um, uh, as a result, there's a, a migration, um, and we wonder today whether we'll see a migration after the uh, 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 COVID is, is done uh, and global warming is done. Uh, and if all this weren't bad enough, here comes another uh, wave from the steppes. This time it's the Turks, and the Turks are going to play a big uh, role. Uh, they, 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 they displace the Arabs in the center of uh, Islam, and they're eventually going to uh, uh, displace uh, Constantinople, which is going to become Istanbul. But as they do this, they create the incentive for the Crusades. Uh, so what the Turks have taken over uh, the, the Crusades, at least the Arabs would let us visit Jerusalem, 
the Turks aren't letting us visit. Let's, let's have a crusade. Um, uh, meanwhile, Islam eventually uh, 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 gets its act uh, together and the, the Turks together uh, with the Arabs managed to, uh, in concert, spread Islam and they take uh, uh, Central Europe and we're going to see that Russia bumps up against uh, uh, this expansion of uh, uh, Islam. And you can see uh, Islam uh, uh, kind of uh, is going to make its, its way into uh, uh, the doors of, of uh, Hungary its, uh, itself. Uh, the, and, and, and with the Turks, the gates of, of uh, uh, Vienna twice. Um, and um, finally, uh, the Turks do take uh, uh, Constantinople and it, it becomes uh, Istanbul, um, and this is uh, uh, their uh, reach into Europe, not that far from, from uh, uh, Vienna, um, and their ex uh, the expansion of uh, is Islam uh, uh, to the uh, east. Uh, and uh, at this point, uh, Orthodox Christianity um, doesn't have a pope. Um, the patriarch of uh, Constantinople uh, is, is being held captive. So Russia says, no problem, uh, will become the head of uh, Orthodox uh, Christianity. And that's going to be the story we're going to have uh, uh, next week. Um, uh, the uh, ulama, which are all the... Uh, uh, Muslim clerics, uh, they decided to uh, hold off the printing press. Uh, as, as, as a civilization, they did without the uh, printing press for 250 years. And that's going to, uh, uh, they, they were worried that they would lose their power. And they were right. They would have lost their power because the Catholics couldn't stop the printing press and uh, they lost power. So at the end of this, what's, what's the attitude of uh, Europeans? Uh, Dante's uh, uh, gate of uh, hell and uh, abandon all hope, ye who enter here. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. So things are not going well at the end of the Middle Ages. Yet, there was still this lingering confidence that, uh, hey, we pulled off the Crusades. Yeah, there were some religious wars, but we've been expanding. Hey, we got some nations still. We do have this thing called the free market and capitalism. We're still trading uh, goods. And these things come a little bit later. But you have people like John uh, Wycliffe who is a uh, theological uh, scholar, and he is, has joined Aquinas and our old friend Peter Abelard, we started the lecture with, and there's a bridge to the Renaissance. And on the other end of the bridge is Da Vinci and Luther. There's another guy up in the middle of the bridge with Erasmus, and that's Petrarch. So when we come back uh, to the, uh, talking about Western Europe after we finish Eastern Europe and Russia. Uh, this is who will be waiting for us at the end of the uh, bridge. So I think that is, oh, this is a, a Carol's slide showing how one in one lifetime you could have the transfer transformation of a civilization uh, to mod, uh, modernity. And I think, uh, this would be the very last one. On top of the bridge is Erasmus, and I'll, I'll be talking more about him and Petrarch uh, when, uh, when we come back. And when we come down from the bridge, Da the, the Vinci will be uh, waiting for us. So um, that's that. Very nice, most interesting. Okay. Uh, any, okay, go ahead, John. 
<laughs> Any questions? Thank you. I have to go. Oh yeah, Shigeko's Bye. got another class. Bye, Shigeko. Yeah. Bye. Bye. <laughs> and I've got my noon class at UCSF, but John, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. That was, that, that was, was, wow, condemned. Fabulous. I know, it was like, woo, man, oh man. Whirlwind. Thank it you. It really ties a lot of stuff together for me that I never really understood how they were connected. It was great. Thank you. I look forward to looking. I'm going to watch it again. <laughs> yeah, I think you almost have to. Yeah. Thank I've, you. Got, I've got to go. My sisters are going to be here any second. My sister's here from Sebastopol. So. Oh, okay. Hi, hi for me. Okay. Thank you so much. You bet. Take care. So Juan Jose, are you making plans on uh, coming to America? Yeah, of course. So <laughs> I still have no idea when I'll go. Probably it's going to be on August uh, because the U.S. Embassy, it's, it's taking its time to give dates. But yeah, like I'm already loving the city, not uh, mainly because of the class that I received from you guys two weeks ago. And... Uh, and yeah, I'm really excited to go. <laughs> well, we I want her to visit you. <laughs> I will receive you whenever you want. And Juan Jose, I'm John's sister. Oh, I'm... Linda, it's a pleasure to meet you. Hi. Oh, hi, uh, mucho gusto. Uh, mucho gusto. A pleasure to meet you. I, I have heard a lot about you. Good thing. Oh, I'm glad to hear. It's a pleasure to meet you, ma'am. Yes, very nice to meet you. How, does, how do your parents feel about you going to America? Well, my father is really serious. He doesn't speak.